Thanks for joining us. This is an interesting episode of Notepad because very recently I was invited to a media roundtable of sorts uh, with the co-president of Mastercard Asia Pacific, Ari Sarkar. Now, in this uh, interview, there were a bunch of other journalists uh, there um, listening in and also asking questions to Ari. Uh, but some of the questions that were answered were mostly uh, questions fielded from Malaysian reporters, including myself. Um, and it ended up being a very candid and very pointed interview to a point where we start to realize that MasterCard has plenty to offer to the market, but there's also challenges that lie ahead. So here is my conversation uh, with Ari Saka regarding the plans of MasterCard Asia Pacific moving forward for uh, the near term. Uh, take a look. Do you foresee um, regulatory framework uh, being a hindrance to what you want to roll out, uh, particularly when there are tremendous uh, differences between the markets in ASEAN alone. Yeah. Um, you were mentioning that ASEAN's biggest problem is in the diversity of nations. Yes. Do you think that that would be a hindrance? Well, I think it's a great question. Uh, you know, uh, it can be a hindrance. I'll be very honest because when you have different countries taking different regulatory positions, I think it can be a hindrance. What I would strongly encourage, and here the ASEAN Bankers Association and the regulators across ASEAN, uh, and, and they're very smart regulators, needs to, with now the RCEP, uh, Regional Comprehensive Economic Partnership collaboration that's coming together, where ASEAN members are all part of RCEP, I think there is an extremely important you know, trade enabler, and I'm uh, really delighted that how our RCEP is progressing here in Asia. But you know, the, the real benefit of RCEP can only be realized that if all other agencies and partners who are going to enable trade are also going to be connected on a common set of values and a common set of what we call technology standards and capabilities, uh, it can be an hindrance. Uh, I'd say in the last three, four years, some of those challenges have been uh, fairly difficult. But if you really want to power up growth, my advice to all ASEAN countries and operating units is that you know, really drive for standardization, drive for interoperability, drive for highest order of safety and security. It can only become an enabler for trade and business. Closing down doors or, or being in a position that I need to develop something of my own so I can call it my own, uh, I think is passe. You know, it, it's not what real value gets created. Value gets created when you know, the two plus two is equal to five effect can only happen when people collaborate on standards, on policy, and therefore you get the real benefit of it. You know, data privacy is going to be the next, uh, you know, what I call uh, the, 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 the citadel to conquer. And uh, I think there, there are challenges. Uh, different countries are taking slightly different approaches. Um, India is obviously looking at data privacy in, in, a, in a very deep sort of way. I know there's a lot of deep industry consultation happening in India, which is the right thing to do. I would strongly encourage ASEAN, and I know Vietnam is looking at uh, data privacy uh, policy. I must comment on Vietnam. The Vietnam authorities have been extremely open-minded in getting feedback and, 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 and inputs from industry and, and market participants. I think that is healthy. Every country needs to engage in that debate. And while you do that, I think it's really important to have clarity on whose interest are you really protecting. Uh, MasterCard has recently announced, and we'll be happy to share, Barkha, yes. our yes. principles of data governance. And we are putting the consumer at the heart of that engagement. Uh, and, and, and it's not, you know, many countries are having this debate, who controls the data? Government controls it, business controls it. And I'm actually uh, not a believer in either one of those approaches. I think it's important to make the consumer control the data that he or she uh, wants to use or a business controls their data on how they want to use it. And at the end of the day, if I as a consumer feel that I want to share my data because sharing my data, provided my data is protected, you know, those are all conditions of what data privacy uh, laws will do, the levels of cryptography, the levels of uh, anonymization, all of those standards around how data gets protected, but I should have the final authority to decide whether I want to share my data because I will judge 
when I share my data, understand the benefits of what you get when you share your data. If you're a business that shares its data with a service provider who can help you get a better deal for what you're doing, that's real incremental benefit to a business. And therefore, let people who own their data decide how they want to use their data. What we shouldn't encourage is when private enterprises and businesses start to position on who will control that data, that is not a good narrative for any country. And I think I, I really would uh, you know, encourage countries to even look at GDPR. Uh, the GDPR regulations in Europe is actually a very progressive set of regulations, which is putting the consumer at the heart of that engagement. The consumer decides when I want to share, when I can decide that today, let's say, Ibrahim, I've shared data with you. Tomorrow I can come back and say, you know what, I've changed my mind. I want to erase, I want you to erase the data you're holding on me. That's the type of right that GDPR is actually providing. Uh, and I think it's a very progressive set uh, of, of, of regulations, which I think countries should all, you know, different countries will have a nuanced way of looking at these things. There are specific market requirements, but I have not seen that the fundamental structure of data governance and how privacy needs to be driven to be different from one market to another. And I think if you start with some of those core principles, and I think we've been very clear in our core principles, and we should share it with all of you. Uh, we made a public announcement uh, of it. Uh, I really think that those guiding principles should drive those policy arguments, uh, which should lead to more standardization. Um, in answering some of the questions fielded by journalists, a question that was fielded by a Banama reporter um, asking Ari about digital tax, because we know that uh, digital tax is going to be uh, implemented uh, in Malaysia um, come January 1st, which is just quite literally five, six weeks away. What is the plan for MasterCard in trying to navigate through regulations that are going to be imposing more digital tax, not just in Malaysia, but in many other markets uh, in Asia Pacific? This is his response. Yeah, completely. No, I think it's a great question. Uh, I think the answer is yes. However, we, while I say yes, we are not changing the fundamental construct of how we do business. We remain committed to a B to B to C business, which means our distribution, our reach is always going to be through another business entity. We are not going to touch the consumer. However, Principles of engagement, safety and security, which is important for consumers to understand and how they need to be, you know, socially aware of what the digitally connected world, while it delivers a lot of good, but there's a lot of harm also that digitally connected world delivers. And therefore, that education process, we will do many of that directly. And also, as we've done historically, all through the innovation of the last 50 years, we continue to power up that discussion and engagement through our so-called issuing and merchant partners on, on both sides of the, the, the payment ecosystem. In fact, if I might add, we've got campaigns running in Indonesia. Yes, Malaysia run safety that is correct. Security. We run safety and security industry-wide campaigns, and we're doing this now, Barka, I think two years, right? Two to three years, more than that, actually, four years. Four years, four years we are running. Uh, actually, this is the fifth year. I remember 2015, is, yes, the first we started, year. yeah. So this is really five years in a running where we are actually driving direct engagement of safety and security benefits for consumers. And, uh, you know, markets like India, we are taking, we've seen uh, the momentum shift and it's probably going to be true with ASEAN. You know, the, it's not just about the big cities. It is how are you going deeper, tier two, tier three cities and towns. And uh, We've signed up brand ambassadors uh, in India, MS, MS Dhoni is our ambassador. We did a big campaign with him very recently. And uh, so I think that, again, finding domestically relevant ambassadors and driving that message of what digital payments does and why it's good, I think is an extremely important enabler. Uh, we are working with industry bodies in ASEAN. In many countries, we're working with Confederation of All India Traders in India, which represents 70 million traders in India. Again, driving education, a wide formalizing 
uh, you know, the, the, uh, the ecosystem of merchants business is actually good for merchants. Uh, and it should not be seen as a worrying factor that more transparency uh, is not in their interest. Uh, and I think that's where we are running. We've done 300 uh, conferences in India uh, across the, uh, the, the length and breadth of India. We are doing similar engagements here in ASEAN and really bringing to bear the understanding of electronic payments and digital payments on why it's good for industry, both consumers, merchants, businesses, uh, in, 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 in a manner that you know, people are, were not aware that how this can be helpful for business. So you know, uh, to be honest, that you know, this is a question that all global platform businesses will have to grapple with. You know, uh, we are still kind of, you know, understanding the uh, the the changes in uh, the regulatory landscape, and, and and countries are looking at this. Uh, we're not concerned uh, about this. You know, it is a case that we feel that countries are looking at this. There is obviously a, a point of origination of a service and then there is a point of delivery I think where countries will have to look at this because let's look at it this way a digitally connected world is increasingly going to lead to cloud-based service capability where technology and IP is going to be built at scale and that's actually important for ASEAN and countries like India because if you want to leapfrog and become part of what we call the, the developed world you now have technology that is democratizing business and therefore barriers to entry are going down. Therefore, don't see technology as a threat, but see technology as an opportunity. Now, having said that, where I think governments will also, and I think governments will be reasonable. I am not seeing anything that by way that there's an unreasonable uh, approach to this whole taxation of digital services is not all costs of driving that digital service is accounted for in the country, if you see what I mean. The costs are being accounted. That's the whole nature of global uh, platform businesses. Uh, but I'm actually reasonably confident that governments will do the right thing when they go out to tax digital services and the tax rates will be different to just traditional business tax rates. Because you know here the businesses don't account for all their cost in the in-market country uh, that you're servicing because the service is coming uh, from somewhere else, although catering to a domestic you know, market. MasterCard Asia Pacific has a large geographical reach anywhere from Pakistan, India to Japan, China, all the way down south to uh, Australia and uh, New Zealand. So because of this mass geographic reach that MasterCard Asia Pacific is operating under, we start to wonder which markets are more uh, um, interesting for MasterCard to focus on? Hence, a question was uh, posed to Ari regarding India's emergence as a crucial market for MasterCard to penetrate and uh, how that interacts with MasterCard's focus in ASEAN countries. Is ASEAN and India the kind of markets that they want to um, focus on and how do they interplay with one another? This is what Ari has to say. You know, we have welcomed competition you know this is i know a lot has been said about the rise of national payments corporation of india uh, but you know at the heart of it you know we have always said we welcome competition in the market you know the beauty of what competition does it accelerates the growth curve of the overall market so when you get acceleration of growth of the overall market everybody benefits right and we are equally beneficiaries of that overall you know, growth momentum. What we've also been very clear is, and particularly in India's context and probably relevant in some of the other ASEAN countries as well, that by all means develop competitive products which you feel is driven domestically built, and, but don't make them stand up by creating regulatory or other non-tariff barriers, if you see what I mean. Because those are, those are not competitively sustainable. And since you come from India, you know very well uh, the history of the 1960s and 70s uh, when we used to grow at the country at 3% economic growth, where even to go to the bathroom, we needed a license, uh, right? Uh, you know, that was the type of red tape and bureaucracy, you know, we have dealt with, right? 
so I think it's very easy to fall into that trap. And I must say that you know, uh, you know, India is a very different country today uh, than what it used to be. Uh, we actually don't see this as a challenge. What we see is that it is not. Yes, share is important, but what is even more important than share is recognition of the fact, which is also very true for ASEAN, is you today have a still a 90% plus cash-based economies. It isn't, the fight isn't about that 10%. What we really have to do is you create an enabling environment where policy, structure, market engagement, standards on technology are all being developed with a view on how are we going to tackle that 90% of that market? How are we ensuring that we are building products and services that cater for not just the rich, not just the middle class, but is going all the way down the economic uh, you know, strata? How are we making sure now that technology is coming of such a level and scale with smart devices, proliferating much deeper down the economic strata, how do we harness the power of what we call computing power that is lying in the average individual's pocket today, uh, which I'm now talking going deep into rural parts of ASEAN and India. There is a massive opportunity for what I call economic uh, value extraction, economic value creation, and I just feel that if policy initiatives were moving around in those directions more than what it has historically been, I think you'll have a real surge of what econo economic development can be achieved in you know, India and ASEAN. Just to give you a sense, driving for digital economies can drive one percentage points of economic growth. A massive enabler for growth across both India and ASEAN is access to credit. You know, small enterprises are starved of access to credit, which is why businesses don't grow. But guess what? Formalization coupled with digital services, with data analytics improving, with your ability to score for credit issuance, are all going to be massive enablers, you know, for credit. You know, we're working with Unilever, actually in India, but we've experimented first in Africa, where Unilever's retail points where they were selling their products from were being sold through extremely small retail outlets in Africa and now it's very similar in India where the retailer just didn't have credit so they could only buy a limited amount of stock from Unilever and the Unilever truck let's say comes once a week if that retailer was out of stock on the third day that means for four days they had no earnings opportunity right and that's the way where what we are doing with Unilever is we've built a platform to completely digitize all of the receipts of that small retailer and all of the payments that that small retailer is making. And that credit history of in and out cash flow is being provided to bank partners who are underwriting small ticket lending. And in a very small way, the, the, the pilot program has shown Unilever that those retailers actually ended up selling 25% more of Unilever products. And Unilever saw growth, and then what has ended up happening, banks have seen that they're able to provide small ticket financing to small retailers without the problem of losses, that when you don't have data to back up your lending you know, practices. So I think you're really creating a win-win uh, scenario you're spreading more financial services without necessarily the higher loss rates that happen when you are operating in an informal environment. Your merchant community and business community is getting access to credit, which means more economic activity. And people upstream who are trying to sell things through the channel are also seeing an uplift in economic activity. So that is the real power of what technology can really deliver. And I think that's that 90% space uh, that I was talking about. Uh, and, and therefore, you know, our energy is really targeting that 90. Uh, Rupee has done exceptionally well uh, in the country. So has UPI, has scaled, uh, you know, uh, very well. But, you know, it's, it's a much bigger pool uh, of capabilities. But we are also interested to see how, you know, a country can't have just one platform. It's a massive single point of failure. 
And if you are aspiring to be a 5 trillion, 10 trillion economy in the coming decades, I, I think the Reserve Bank of India has come out with a draft paper uh, of looking at options for creating a more uh, you know, diversified infrastructure environment uh, for digital payments and services. And we are actually very delighted to see that development. Uh, and we are exploring to see how we could also bring other uh, capabilities. We've made some big announcements in India of our investment plan. Yes. Another billion dollars we will invest over the next five years. And uh, some augmenting our current network capability and some will be new capabilities that you know we will bring into India. And in any organization, when you embark on a journey of transformation, aggressive growth, um, demanding more out of your partners, you tend to wonder, these organizations, are they ready themselves from a point of view of the employers and employees working inside them? So my question to Ari is very pointed. I asked him, is MasterCard having the necessary firepower in terms of staff strength, staff mentality, um, and the staff desire uh, to get more uh, from their business? Uh, because nothing is going to work unless uh, MasterCard employees themselves are ready for change. So this is Ari's uh, response to my question. Well, you know, it's a great question. If you really look at how MasterCard as a company has transformed in the last 10 years, is 10 years ago, we used to have a global employee base of somewhere around 5,000 people. Of that base, I'd say 10 years on, only about 2,500 of that 5,000 is left. We today have about 17,500 employees. So to give you a sense, more than 80% of this company is less than 10 years old. 10 years ago, 90% of the workforce was US centric. Today, we have over 55, I, I don't have the exact statistic, but somewhere around 50% plus, right? Our employee base, more than half of our employees are outside of the United States. And if you really look at our Asia presence, 10 years ago, Asia Pacific had a presence of probably 150 to 200 people all across Asia Pac. Today, we have over 3,600 people out in Asia. Uh, so this is a really dramatic, with India being such a massive hub for us. You know, India, we were 28 employees in 2013, not going back too far. We have 2,000 today. And if you really think about our plans on where we are heading uh, in, in, in India, and including the rest of Asia, we have very aggressive plans for continued growth. So you've raised a fundamental question. And if you looked at the average age of the company, and we'll be able to provide you some statistics on this, has dramatically come down in the last 10 years. So you know we are hiring people from uh, traditional hiring ground for MasterCard executives was banks. Today, only 15% of our executives come from banks. It's coming from telcos, it's coming from the merchant universe, it's coming from technology platform companies, it's coming from cyber security companies, uh, it's coming from uh, you know, uh, as you know, divergent as uh, what we call government agencies. Uh, we've had people from UIDI who've joined us you know, in the past. So it's really the diversity of the talent pool and the people that we are bringing into the company with a diverse set of skills is making that transition as we identify new partners and new players to work with a much, much easier one. If we had people with the same mindset, the same profile, the same age category, the same set of experiences, that would have been the biggest stumbling block. And I, I, we just don't feel that, you know. Um, I'm not seeing it as a challenge anymore, but it was a challenge not too long ago. 
So those are the kind of uh, conversations that are in store for you. It's not just the uh, interview that we had with Ari Saka, the co-president of Mastercard. There's plenty of things on offer as well. So if you've missed any part of this interview, just head on to astroawani.com. Look for Notepad over there. Most of our interviews are placed uh, over there on that particular microsite. Now, you can also enjoy these kind of interviews on your mobile devices. Just download the Astro Awani app wherever you get your application. Thanks very much for watching. Until next time.